All right, so that was the most important Linux buffer overflow to look at. And this is the most important Windows buffer overflow to look at. This is the standard training product. This Vuln server is a server designed to learn exploit development on Windows. And there's a little bit of a setup involved. Uh, what you have to do is have a Windows server and you can use a Google Cloud server or any other Windows machine you like, but you have to turn off the data execution prevention protection. So you do that here in performance options and then restart the server. And then you download this thing called Vuln Server and run it. And then you will have to open your firewall to let that traffic in. And if you're on a cloud machine connecting from outside the same local security group, you'll have to open the cloud firewall also. In this case, I'm doing it all on Google Cloud here. So I have a Google Cloud Debian machine, which is going to be my attacker, and have a Google Cloud Windows machine. And they're both in the same internal IP group. So if they use these 10 addresses, they can talk to each other, and there is no cloud firewall between them. So I've got my Windows machine here. And if I run IP config, I can see my address is 10.128.04. And if I go to my Google Linux machine, which is here, this is my Debian machine. Let me clear it and do that. All right, I can ping that 10.128.04, and I get a response to the ping. So that's good. That means the firewall is not blocking it. And so now I can use Netcat to connect 10.128.04 on port 9999, and I see vulnerable server. So if you type help, It'll give you some commands, and these commands each have vulnerabilities of various sort. So I'm going to exit, and we're going to make attack code here that will attack that server. And since I'm running it, you can see here's Vuln server here, uh, waiting for client connections. It got a connection, connection closing. You know, it's just a simple little server running there. Now, we go to my instructions, and we'll make the first attack code. And the first, this is fuzzing the server. So I'll call this fuzz1. And I'm using Python 2 again, just because that's what was common when I did this first. So nano fuzz1.py, I guess. All right, so there's my code. And I need to adjust the address. Um, and the address is. 10, 128.04, okay. So the server is here. So it will connect to that server on port 9999, and then it will ask me for the length of an attack. And when it connects, it will then send trun space dot, and then however many capital A's I put in length. It's just going to uh, someplace. Yeah, here we are, here's the attack. Capital A times length. So that's all it does. This is a fuzzer. So I do control X, Y, enter, and then Python, fuzz one. Okay. So now I can send, say, 10 A's. And it, you can see here, let me move this out of the way. You can see it had another connection and it did not crash. It handled that just fine. So I can send 100 A's. And it handles that just fine. So I can send 1,000 A's. And it handles that fine, so the server can do it. But if I send more, like 2,000, it handles, then it crashes. Notice it did not say goodbye or trun complete. It crashed. So if you go here, it now pops up a box saying Vuln server has stopped working. So I found a vulnerability, and this is the process of exploit development. You send junk at the server until it crashes. When it crashes, you now try to figure out, is this a crash that I can exploit or not? Most crashes are not exploitable. They're just something like resource consumption. You fill the region of memory to where it can't hold anymore, but you never actually gain control of the instruction pointer. But this one, of course, is going to be exploitable. And so in order to learn how to exploit it, you have to run it in a debugger, just like we did on Linux. So on Windows, the fun bugger to debugger to use is Ollie Debug. That's the classic one. So I'm going to run Ollie debug and run the server inside there.
And you could use other debuggers like WinDebug or X32 or X64 debug. There's lots of debuggers and they can all do the same job essentially. So I open my uh, downloads. I want to find uh, Vuln Server, which is here. Okay, there it is. Now, when you load something into a debugger, it loads the executable and gets ready to run, and then it shows you pause down here. It's not running yet. That's the whole point of a debugger. It doesn't run anything. It opens it and prepares it, and then you can examine it. But in this case, I just want to run it, so I hit go. Now, it just pauses again because I'm running 32-bit code on a 64-bit operating system. So the first start just loads the 32-bit virtual environment, the Windows on Windows environment of Microsoft, and I have to run it again before it's actually really running. So now it's listening for commands. So now I can send commands from my Linux server again. So if I run this program again and I give it 2000, now it crashes. And it shows me here access violation when writing to 41, 41, 41, 41. And that's kind of small, but that is what it says. So it crashed, but it crashed on a write operation. Now the 41s are A's. When I put in 2000 A's, it um, crashes when writing to that invalid address. So I do not have control of the instruction pointer directly. I have control of a write operation. Now it is possible to take over the server just with a write, but it's not the simplest way. And I hope I can find a better crash. So let's just do debug restart and say yes again. And let's try sending even a longer attack. Let's try sending 3000. Oh, by the way, it's not gonna work because it's still paused. I have to do run and run again. Now it's running. Okay, so let's send 3000. And now, it crashed and you look down here, it says access violation when executing 41, 41, 41, 41. So this is what I want. A length of 3000 means that some of those A's I put in ended up directly in the instruction pointer and that is the easiest kind of exploit to uh, use. So that's the way to start. The simplest exploit and this now is exactly analogous to what you did on Linux. You can now control the instruction pointer and so you can just learn how to use this debugger and uh, talk about how to do it. So once you find that crash, now you just have to find which of those A's ended up in the instruction pointer. And you can do that by making a non-repeating pattern of characters. You, there's a Metasploit module to do it, or you can just write your own little Python script like I did that makes a non-repeating pattern. This has a three-digit number that counts up and then always an A. And so when you send all that junk up, you can see where it crashes, and it crashes at this, which is 1A25 in hex. And so you can find the 1A25 here, and you can figure out how many characters it is in. And it turns out that it is uh, 2,006 characters. The next four characters end up in the instruction pointer. This is just what we did on Linux. You do it on Windows. So now you control the instruction pointer, and now you have to put in some code to execute. So you can start by just putting in break code and getting it to crash. And then you can, you have to put in just bad characters because not all characters are injectable. This is the same thing that happens to someone doing the, um, the code injection. It was blocking the slashes. And typically some characters you cannot inject like space, tab, carriage return, and so on. So you find which characters are forbidden and it turns out that in this case, um, I think uh, nulls are almost always forbidden because they terminate strings. Anyway, so you have to try injecting all these characters until you find all the bad characters. And then you can generate malware. And the easiest way to generate malware is to use Metasploit. And Metasploit, um, you can inject a Metasploit shellcode. Now the other problem is um, you have to use Mona because you're going to not be able to inject code and run it directly anymore on Windows because of address-based layout randomization. Remember, we turned that off on Linux, but on a Windows machine, you can't turn it off easily. So every time you run Vuln Server, it relocates to a random memory location. So even though I can inject an instruction pointer, I can't find the code I've injected. So what I have to do is do a trampoline attack where I find some code that somebody else wrote that doesn't move, that contains a jump ESP. 
And then I go to that address and it jumps to my stack pointer and my stack pointer points to wherever my code is. So that's what's going on here. So you install this uh, immunity plugin called Mona, which can do that job for you. And then you can um, run this command. Uh, let me get it here, there. You can now check the security settings of the modules. And you will see there are various modules loaded here, various Windows libraries, DIL files, and so on. But the two that matter to me are Vuln Server and ESS Funk. And the reason is it shows you which Microsoft security settings are applying to each module. And I want one without address space layout randomization. And you can see they're all randomized except for two, Vuln Server itself and a DIL, ESS Funk, some library it's using. Now the Vuln Server itself, however, is loaded at this address, 00407000. ,000. And the problem is, if I refer to any addresses in that module, those addresses will contain null bytes. And if I put a null byte in a string I inject into C code, which is what this is, the null will terminate the string and all the bytes after that won't go in. So I cannot use null bytes in my attack. So this module is out of reach. But this module loaded at a higher memory address, 6250-8000, so it contains a lot of code with addresses that do not contain null bytes. And all I have to do is find a jump ESP in here that I can point to, and it's also not randomized. So this is the uh, Achilles heel of Microsoft security defenses. Microsoft constantly announces new, very powerful security defenses, but they typically do not actually apply to all the code on the box. And all you have to do is find the code. It's like a, a security guard that locks most of the doors but forgets and leaves one door unlocked. You just have to find the one they didn't lock. And in this case, it's this function, ESSFunk.dil. And so you can use a Mona command to find a jump ESP. A jump ESP is FFE4. And so you find there are, in fact, um, nine places in that function where there's a jump ESP and these addresses do not contain zeros. So now you just have to do the same thing. You have to print, your exploit looks a little more complicated, but it's not very complicated. You have 2006 A's to get to the instruction pointer. You inject that address 6250 AF backwards, the same way as you did on Linux. Then you have a NOP sled, a break, then you put in your exploit, which is gonna come here and it will run. And to get the exploit code, I used, I tested it with just nops and a break to make sure that you could get to the exploit and run it. And then to put in real exploit code, you use Metasploit. So this is the Metasploit that makes a reverse shell, MSF Venom. This makes a interpreter shell calling your home server on a port you're listening on. And it turns out the only bad character that you had to avoid was null byte. So this is the, uh, code to avoid putting null bytes in and put it in Python. So Metasploit will write the Python for you that does your attack. And all you have to do is copy this Python code and put it in your exploit file. So you'll end up with an exploit file that has that, that in it and all this junk. And when you run that, it can then phone home. So you um, have a vulnerable server, you end up with, you uh, send that in, and when you send it in, it will phone back home and you get an interpreter shell on the Windows box. So like I say, this is the important project. This goes through all the steps of finding a vulnerability, uh, determining whether it is exploitable in a debugger, and then going through all the steps required to actually inject malware and run the malware to take over the box. So it's the same thing you did in the Linux box, but you know, there's a few extra steps on Windows and you know, it's good to go through it all. I had a student that went, the guy had the OSCP and he went and got the OSCE, the reverse engineering degree. And he said, I think for OSCP, this was the thing that was most important, learning how to develop and exploit. Um, he said, study this project until you're good at it. That'll be a big step at getting the offensive security uh, um, Certified professional certification. That's what he right. told me. Yeah, I have the OSCP too. And yeah. the, the basic w exploiting windows is going to be on your test. So know how to do that. You don't, you don't have to know about um, using ROP change or anything. Just know how to do a basic uh, windows uh, stack overflow. Yeah, this is the fundamental thing. All other attacks are based on this. The basic stack overflow on Linux and Windows 
you should be familiar with them. And all the other fancy attacks are variations on this one. So let me post this video.